So have you heard about the importance of being co-regulated with your child? And what does that even really mean? And is there a way that makes it easy and not sound like this like crazy word? And I don't quite get that. So I'm so delighted to talk to Linda Murphy here today. She wrote the book on this topic right here, Co-Regulation Handbook. And um, I can't wait to get started. So Linda, would you please share some of what is your background that led you into this kind of work? Was there some uh, particular moment that you liked or, or what happened? Sure. Um, I'm a speech language pathologist and I've, I've been one for over 20 years. Um, and as I was working in the field of speech language pathology, I just knew there was more training that I wanted or just some things that I knew I could do better in the area of social competence, executive function, that sort of thing. Um, and I learned about relationship development intervention and then also uh, became a, a relationship development intervention or RDI consultant. Um, and what that did, you know, a part of the training and, and the techniques we use in RDI is declarative language and co-regulation. Um, and I feel like once I kind of had those tools and ideas in my toolbox, so much changed for me as a therapist and a communicator and a parent, just in how I approach kids or think about things. So then what does declarative language mean exactly? And then I'll ask you the same as far as what does co-regulation really mean? Mm -hmm. So declarative language is a speaking style. Um, I think often when kids have learning challenges or learning differences, people might get really either imperative with them, which means they tell them exactly what to do, or they ask a lot of questions to pull language out of them or to quiz to see if they know something. But declarative language is very much the opposite. It's about um, just using a lot of commenting to think out loud, to notice things together, share memories together, state opinions, notice problems, guide a child, for example, on what to do um, using commenting. So it's just this whole shift in speaking and communication style that generously gives information to kids versus places demands on them to perform or come up with a specific answer or perform a specific action in the moment. Um, and I Anything, share yeah. why that is so, why, why I love what you're saying, because as you're speaking, I'm remembering when my ch first children were five, six, I decided I was going to try and homeschool them. And so the thing that I did all the time was be like, you know, this here, look at this word, right? Like this word is this. And then like later down on the page, what's this word? And that's just a small example of like the many times that I essentially did what you were talking about in terms of saying like, quizzing them or asking questions or asking to draw something out of them. And, and it just, yeah, it didn't work. I, I didn't, yeah. I, mean, I didn't know what else to do. So. <laughs> yeah. And I think um, for a lot of kids who have social learning differences or even learning challenges, they also get a lot of anxiety and worry that they're not going to be able to perform or do what's expected or come up with the right answer. So when people use language that's questioning, quizzing, imperative, it increases anxiety for kids, which makes learning harder. So declarative language just really opens up the process of learning because it, it helps kids, I think, lower their guard and just trust the, the person that they're with, that they're not going to put them in over their head and they're there to guide them forward, give information and teach at a level um, that's manageable for them in the moment. Um, and always just keep them successful. That's amazing. So yeah. Then, that naturally flows into this idea of co-regulation as well. Yeah, so co so the way I talk about it in um, co-regulation handbook is that declarative language is a way of speaking, but co-regulation is a way of being. So declarative language, you set the landscape in your speaking style that this is supportive, invitational, um, not placing demands, but then the other piece of it is just knowing how to support kids in the moment with their actions or with whatever sequence of steps, for example, we might they might need to do. So co-regulation is just really thoughtfully always carving out a competent role for the child, no matter what, in whatever you're doing. That um, and then where you also might have a contingent role 
So you and the child are working as a team. So your roles are contingent, but you're always keeping in mind what the child's role is so that they can be confident or independently successful with maybe just a tiny bit of your help. Um, and again, that really just helps any, any anxiety or worry really decrease because the child comes to understand and trust that you're always gonna, you're gonna set them up for success. And it's not that you're not gonna challenge them, but you're always just gonna challenge them at the edge or at that place where they, they can get there versus throwing them in the deep end and then having to prompt and prompt and prompt because what you're asking them to do is way above their, their skill set at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of a challenging situation, perhaps like um, try, just trying to make sure to get to school on time, right? Like let's assume you're trying to get to school on time, but there's uh, clothes that aren't uh, are getting in the way, right? And all of the other different things that have to happen just to get to school on time. How would this play into that scenario? Yeah, well, I, what I always say too is like the first time you practice the ideas of declarative language or co-regulation, you don't necessarily, like a huge part of both of them is being able to slow down and breathe and give your time, your child time to process what you've said, time to notice things in their environment, time to assume the role that you're assigning to them. And, and it takes time at the beginning just to kind of get in that groove. And if we, if we first implement these ideas at a time that we feel rushed and stressed, we're gonna get imperative, we're gonna pick up our pace, we're gonna end up prompting, which is the opposite. So I always say, you know, those times when you might feel stressed aren't the best places to begin, or you could practice maybe getting out the door on a weekend when you don't feel as rushed. Um, and, and you just begin to, you know, try those things out one exchange at a time at a opportunity in the week when you don't feel pressure and you internalize the concepts and then they're more easily transferable to that time in the morning when you have to go, go, go. But imagining that you have practiced, you know, at a, at a different time than, you know, when you feel rushed and pressured, but getting out the door in the morning might be something like, um, if your child needs their, their coat, you might say something like, oh, I notice you don't have your coat on yet, or, ooh, it looks pretty cold outside, or I'm, or even I'm gonna get my coat now. So you're commenting to guide them toward the step that you would like them to take without saying, go get your coat. And even, you know, what that does is, you know, go get your coat is a very discreet direction, which they could probably follow, maybe, maybe not. But when you use those declarative comments, you know, you kind of have the choice to talk about the bigger picture, the weather, um, give them opportunity to problem solve. If you were to say, oh, you're missing something or even experience share um, and create a social opportunity. Like I'm getting my coat now. So it becomes a partnership where you are, you know, just in sync and together in that moment. So that would be, for example, the declarative language end. And then the co-regulation end might be again, so you're thinking about competent contingent roles. So imagine you wanna pack your child's backpack or you, wanna, you want them to pack it, but starting out with co-regulation, you, you can partner with them. So you would maybe get the backpack and say, um, you know, let's get your things and we can put it in your backpack together. I'll get your backpack and you can unzip it. So maybe the roles are you're the holder and the child unzips it. And then you think together about what they might need. So you could say, oh, how about I'll hold the backpack open while you get your lunchbox and put it in. Or um, you can hand me your binder and I'll help you put it in. So there's just roles and actions that are done in partnership to smoothly um, and positively move the process forward in, a, in just a, a way that's connecting and positive between you and the child. And just even that, I think like that reframing of thinking about it like as we're a team and I'm here to support you. You have your part, I have my part, but our, our shared goal is to get out the door. Um, I think even just when you start to frame it in that way and think about it in that way, it feels so much better because when you're imperative and prompting you, you and your child's not doing what you want them to do, you just feel frustrated because you're telling them get their backpack and they're stalling or they're dilly-dallying or they're not doing it. Um, 
So I feel like co-regulation and declarative language just gets rid of gets rid of the power struggle, gets rid of the frustration, and you just get it moving in a way that's positive and connecting, like I said, for both of you. Mm -hmm. And that reframe can be really, really powerful. I imagine you have um, stories from your practice about how it made a big difference for people. Yeah, yeah. And even I'm like, and I do my best to practice it at home. I have two, two boys who are nine, uh, nine and 11. So I get lots of practice getting everyone out the door. Sometimes I have more patience than others, but, but I try. Yeah. But the, and that's wonderful to be like, uh, just on the same page. And another thing from your book that I really enjoyed was your definition of executive function, because mm -hmm. I feel like that can be an amorphous concept a little bit. And how do you wrap your head around that? So can you share with us totally. a little bit about that and, yeah. and, and your perspective? I'll try, but same thing. I'm always like, oh, it's so hard to just um, nail this concept down because it's so big and you know when your child struggles with it but then there's so many aspects of it but for me and I think this is what I wrote in the book um, like the process of executive function for example is first just have conceiving an idea knowing what it is that you want to get done but then as part of that you have to also picture in mind the things that you might need to get it done and then you might need to think through the sequence of steps that you need to do to get it done. So all these things are happening in your head where you have to imagine your end goal, imagine what you need, imagine the steps, put them in order. So all that's organization that we do in mind and people who, who have strong executive function, like that's no problem, you can do all that and work and manipulate those pieces of information. Um, but that's internally and then, and then the output is being actually able to execute all of that in the right order, um, sustain attention regardless of, of distractions, like stay focused and on task um, to meet your goal, to, um, to know when you're done, but then even back it up a little bit because you also have to manage time because you have to know, do I have enough time to get all these steps done right now or is it something where i need to chunk this activity over the course of time because my time right at this moment isn't quite enough so you have to be able to just appraise the time you're going to need to get it done as well as the time that you have so a lot of little strands <laughs> mm -hmm. but as you're yeah. describing that that helps me to think about this example where you gave of like packing the backpack in the morning and all of um, the thought that goes into the different, another, another idea that you introduced in, in the book that I think is really helpful is roles, right? Like, so mm -hmm. what are the different roles for the role for the parent, the role for, for the child? How would that play that idea also add to this example of getting ready in the morning and packing the backpack? For example? Yeah. So I think, you know, I kind of described it um, before, but, you, but it also really helps kids when you name roles. So if you're getting the backpacks together, you might see, might, you could say something like, you're the lunchbox getter and I'll be the backpack holder, or you're the zipper guy and I'm the binder gal. Um, so just naming roles really can be helpful to kids because it just really um, helps them know what they need to do. Um, and kids, there's something about like that, just the idea of role language that that kids um, rise up and 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 feel, I think, pride in assuming a role versus doing a task. It's just ownership in the moment. Um, yeah. What a great perspective. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, another idea that has come up is. Um, I've had somebody ask me, for example, uh, I use a visual chart at home, but how do I get somebody off of that visual chart? And I know you have some ideas around that as well. Can you? Yeah. So I think like when you're visual charts, I think can be okay if you notice your child is starting to internalize some of the steps, like maybe they don't, they are referencing the chart on their own or independently, and they're using that as their reminder or they're using that to help them move along. But if you are prompting the child to look at the visual chart 
to then know what they're supposed to do, then you're still in that prompting um, like pattern. So, and I think when I think of a visual chart, it's often just linear, like do this. Okay, now do that. Okay, now do this, which is imperative. And I think what co-regulation does instead is it just helps you figure out where in the process your child might be competent to start. Um, so the part that you're engaging them as your partner at the beginning, they're going to be independent and they've had that. So therefore they can do it and they can internalize it pretty quickly. But then you as the guy just kind of watching and reading their cues in the moment, you're just gradually transferring responsibility. So whatever might be your role, you're gradually giving them part of your role as you notice they're ready. And I think what helps kids remember, and all of us really, what helps any of us remember and learn and hold on to something is just our ability to master it, to internalize it. Um, and I think the process of co-regulation just really gives kids that opportunity to internalize and master something. And that's what leads to in independence versus being prompted, prompted, prompted. Yeah, yeah. That, that was such the beautiful, that was one of the aspects of your book that I enjoyed so much, the most, right? Is this uh -huh. idea of we're moving towards independence because I think mm -hmm. that, that is our goal. Yeah. yeah. These children will one day be able to fly on their own and leave the national. Right, so, yeah, and I can even, a great model for that. Um, like I can give you some examples from my kids because, you know, when I'm in a therapy room with, with a child, we might be doing, you know, uh, we, you know, we could be doing household stuff, but I get a lot of practice just with actual household stuff with my own children. And um, so they're nine and 11 and some examples are laundry. So the way back where it started was maybe we carry the basket of clothes together to the washing machine. So we're carriers together. And then we were um, like, maybe I would hand an item to one child and they would put it in the washing machine so we were passers and placers with the washing machine and then you're putting soap and it might be that they hold open the place where you put soap and I'm the pourer um, but there's all these roles and actions that I could give them not independently to start but as my partner but then as we do it together over time there's certainly steps that they've now watched me do and I can fade back and give them a little more responsibility um, and for my boys, like this worked and I don't, they do their laundry completely independently right now. I don't do it at all. And they even have, um, sh they share roles together. So it's kind of neat. Like they've picked up this role language where one might say, okay, I'll bring the basket to the basement and you put it in the washing machine or I'll bring it upstairs and you fold. Um, so they've kind of figured out how to do these partnership roles. Like it was initially me and them, but then they've, they've, you know, I have been able to transfer my role to them completely. And now they figure out how to share with each other based on what they might want to do at that point in time. Um, yeah, so that's, that's just a role where my boys are totally independent now. I don't, you know, I'm not picky about how they fold their laundry. They just, they get it all done and that's okay for me. Yeah. <laughs> that's a beautiful, another beautiful example of explaining mm -hmm. and giving clarity to the ideas that you're talking about. Yeah. Are there, as we're looking to wrap up this conversation, is there something else that you'd like to add before I uh, then ask you where we can find you online? Yeah, so so I think um, like they, they might sound like fancy words, declarative language and co-regulation, but what, what I think is just great to keep in mind is they're not hard concepts to learn. So I don't want anyone to ever feel intimidated. It's just, I think once you, you learn the concept, then it's just a matter of you remembering to kind of incorporate them when you see opportunities. Um, and, you know, just like we were talking about with kids, the more you do it, the more you internalize it, it becomes automatic. You see how much it brings. Um, so, so that's my thing. It's like, it's not hard to learn. The hard part might be remembering to do it and just knowing to be thoughtful in our words and, our, and, and just slowing down to create roles for kids. But it's really, really, really worth it because um, because it empowers kids. They gain pride. Um, they feel competent. You see them growing in their independence. It, it's a very positive teaching strategy, and it just feels so much better. Whereas, you know, the other types, imperative, prompting, demanding, questioning, like that's a drain on us as parents too. Um, so I think these strategies just 
just turn everything upside down and help everybody feel better. So I would just say, don't be afraid to try and give it a try. And, um, you know, and, and I think in, in both books, I have troubleshooting tips because, you know, you're going to try it and something might not work or it doesn't work every time. And that's totally normal. Um, so you can always refer back to just the troubleshooting tip chapter because yeah, there's lots of things that we can think about in, in when we, just refine what we're doing in the moment with kids to better support them or scaffold as needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that because I totally agree. It's, it's hundred percent empowering for you as a parent as well, because then it's not situation dependent. You take this idea and you apply it anywhere you need to for your, like your unique personality and your child's unique personality. And mm -hmm. um, so thank you for the work that yeah. you've done and putting yeah. this together for us and mm -hmm. your uh, declarative language handbook as well. Where can we find you online? Yeah, so I try to post lots of ideas and on um, social media, Facebook and Instagram. I've been doing a lot of just pictures or snapshots around my own house with maybe something that my boys have left me and the declarative statement I might use, or um, I take a photo of possible competent goals for kids um, where you can implement co-regulation. And then every Sunday, I, I usually write a blog post just so it's a little bit more thoughtful, something that has come up with um, families that I work with or my own kids that I want to reflect on and just share with a greater community. But if you go to declarativelanguage.com, you, um, you can get information on the book, but there's links for the Facebook page and Instagram on there as well. Wonderful. And we'll make sure yeah. to write that into the show notes too. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for your time and for sharing with us today. It has been such a pleasure to speak with you and we appreciate your wisdom. Great, thank you so much for having me and giving me the opportunity to share all that's so important to me. I appreciate it. It's such a pleasure.